Testing. Good morning. Oh, yep. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to South Highland Presbyterian Church. We're so glad to have you with us this morning, uh, joining us as we worship the Lord together on this Lord's Day. Um, I just invite you right now, as we are gathering, to go ahead and read our scriptures for this morning and go ahead and meditate on them so that way when they're being read aloud to us, it's not the first time that you're hearing these words this morning. We can never read the scriptures enough, so over and over again is what I encourage for all of you this morning. So let's draw near to the Lord and ask him to be with us as we prepare to worship him.
Stand, please stand as you're able and join me in our call to worship from Isaiah this morning. Come everyone who is thirsty, come to the water and you without silver, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without silver and without cost. Pay attention and come to me. Listen so that you will live. I will make a permanent covenant with you on the basis of the faithful kindnesses of David. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call to him while he is near. Let the wicked abandon their ways. Let them return to the Lord, for he will freely forgive. pray with me. Almighty and ever-living God, we praise your name. We adore you this morning, Lord, because you have given us the gift of yourself. You are a God who comes to your people, who reaches out to us. And Lord, we feel that in the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit. And it's by his power that we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, this morning we're talking a lot about the Holy Spirit, and one of the things that the Spirit does for us is reminds us of our sin and draws us back to the heart of God. And so as we draw near to him in confession, let us remember that the Spirit is guiding us on our way. Please pray together with me. Our Heavenly Father, we acknowledge and confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Our thoughts about you are small. We have not considered your blessings. We have not trusted your promises. Deepen within us our sorrow for the wrong we have done and the good we have left undone. Forgive us and restore to us the joy of your salvation. Bind up that which is broken. Give life to our minds strength to our wills, and rest to our souls. It is in the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray.
When the Lord introduces himself to Moses, he said, I am slow to anger, merciful, gracious, abounding in steadfast love. And in confidence in that being God's character, we can believe the good news of the gospel. So friends, believe the good news in the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. O oh Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall show forth your praise. Because we have been reconciled to the Father through Christ, the Spirit now comes to us and offers us peace that surpasses any sort of logical understanding. And so as we greet one another in the name of Christ, we remind each other that we have been granted that peace with God and that we've been granted peace with one another. So friends, the peace of Christ be with you this morning. Indeed, may the peace of Christ be with you all once again. Welcome to South Holland Presbyterian Church. We're so glad to have you in worship with us today. Uh, as, before we continue in worship, I just wanted to lift up a few announcements for you. The, the bulletin has sort of everything going on in the life of our community, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of those. This Tuesday night, you are invited to come watch Bob's Tigers, our illustrious softball team, uh, play. They'll be playing at 830 at the Hoover East Softball Complex. It's always a good time, so I strongly encourage you to come out to that and support the team. And that's a great way to prepare for the fellowship event we're gonna have next Wednesday, July 20th, here outside in the circle. It's called Take Me Out to the Circle. It's sort of a baseball-themed uh, family night and opportunity to come and enjoy a tailgate dinner, and there'll be popsicles and popcorn. And rumor has it that the Birmingham Barons Moscat, uh, Mos Moscat, mascot, could not say that word, excuse me. Babe Ruff, Babe Ruff is his name. Rumor has it he will be here, so obviously uh, you would hate to miss that. So welcome you out next Wednesday, July 20th. 
Uh, tomorrow, our youth are heading down to the beach for their summer conference. Abby and Dallas will be leading them. So just ask you to remember them this week in your prayers uh, for energy for Abby and Dallas, uh, for safety as they make travels down to the beach and back. And, and these, these kinds of trips are really important in the life of our students, can really help deepen their faith. And so, so pray that the Holy Spirit would work in the hearts of our high schoolers throughout the week. Uh, and if you have prayers to spare, I'll be home with our two-year-old and three-month-old by myself <laughs> while Abby is away, so pray for me as well. Um, and then uh, Larry wanted me to make sure to remind you all who are in the older adults ministry. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. You know who you are. Uh, there's sort of a rebranding effort going on. There's going to be a new name for this older adults ministry, and I believe they've got it down to five. And so look in your emails, I believe, for a, uh, a poll, and you can vote on your favorite choice for this new name for the older adult ministries. It's also my privilege to announce an exciting new hire that we have made here at the church. Uh, Kenny Lewis, our new director of music ministry, uh, taking the place of Matthew Grauberger when he leaves, very sadly, uh, at the end of the month. Uh, Kenny comes to us from the Church of St. Michael and All Angels Episcopal Church in Anniston. Uh, some of you may know Kenny a little bit. He's kind of a familiar face around here because he was the one who led the organ renovation and restoration project uh, last year. So he knows this instrument really well, and, and the staff's had a chance to interact with him and get to know him. So we are extremely sad about Matthew leaving and also extremely excited about the doors that the Lord is opening to continue to write the next chapter of the music ministry at South Highland. Kenny will wear uh, a few different hats. He'll be the director of the music ministry. He will be the handbell choir director, and he will also be our organist. So we're very, very excited about uh, the musician and leader that we are getting in Kenny. He has a wife named Melissa and a son, Nathaniel, and so I trust that y'all will welcome them into the South Highland community warmly when Kenny starts on September 1st. Now, in a moment, as you see in the bulletin, we're gonna have a moment for mission. I'm gonna invite up two of our missionary partners to share a little bit about their work and how God is at work throughout the world. Uh, but due to the sensitive nature of where they are located, we cannot broadcast what they are about to share with us. So if you are watching on the live stream, we're gonna cut the camera and the microphone for like three minutes, and then I promise you we'll be right back uh, once they are done, so just just hang tight and stick around, um, and I encourage you to use this time to pray for all of our missionary partners, and, and especially these two that we'll be hearing from today. So once I get the okay from the tech crew, I will invite them up.
I'll wait till I have the thumbs up from the tech guys. All right, welcome back uh, to worship at South Highland. At this point, I'm going to invite Abby up and the children uh, as well for a children's message. So come on down. All right, everybody, y'all come up and hang out with me for a bit. Hello, guys. We've got some brothers and some sisters coming up. Hey, everybody. All right, y'all want to get a little closer, or is that, is that, you know, come on. We love each other. Um, all right, guys, today we are going to talk about the Holy Spirit. Have y'all heard of the Holy Spirit before? I hope so. Um, and I want us to try and remember together three big things that the Holy Spirit does. So we are going to do some hand motions that are going to help us remember, okay? All right, the first thing I want us to remember the Holy Spirit does is he comforts us. Can y'all say he comforts us? He comforts us. The second thing I want us to remember is that he invites us to Jesus when we sin. So can y'all say he invites us? And the third thing I want us to remember is that he guides us as we live a godly life for God. So can y'all say, he guides us? All right, now I want us to stand up. This is getting risky, but we're going to do it. And I want us to remember by these hand motions. So the first thing, he comforts us. I want us to do a big group hug. Can we do a big group hug, guys? Come on, group hug. He comforts us. Yay! All right, and the second thing he does, which y'all are already doing, is he invites us. So can y'all say, yay, come on, come on. And then, and then the last thing he does is he guides us. So can we all hold hands and guide each other in a line, just like the Holy Spirit does for us. Yay, we're going to just walk, 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 walk. All right, let's keep holding hands and let's pray to God, all right? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for giving us the gift of your Holy Spirit. We are so grateful that you comfort us, that you guide us, and that you invite us to Jesus. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, guys, let's go to enrichment. Please join me in prayer. God, do not let our desire for information dominate our need for transformation. Let us hear the word and be moved to greater faith and obedience. Amen. The epistle reading for today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 6 through 16. Yet among the mature, we do speak wisdom, though it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age. We are doomed to perish, but we speak God's wisdom, secret and hidden, which God decreed before the ages of our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would have crucified the Lord of glory. They would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. These God, things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For what human being knows what is truly except the human spirit that is within? So also no one comprehends what is truly God's except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit that is from God, so that we may understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. And when we speak of these things in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual things to those who are spiritual. Those who are unspiritual do not receive the gifts of, the, of God's Spirit, for they are foolishness to them, and they are unable to understand them because they are discerned spiritually. Those who are spiritual discern all things, and they are themselves subject to no one else's scrutiny. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Again, good morning. It's a privilege to be here with you and to 
Open up God's word together. Our gospel lesson today is from John chapter 14, verses 15 through 27. I encourage you to uh, have it before you in the bulletin, or if you want to open up in the Bible, either one works. Please stand with me as out of reverence for the reading of God's word. <clears throat> this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me, because I live you also will live. And on that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, Those who love me will keep my word and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Be Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> in our next few moments together, we pray that you would, by the power of your Spirit, open our eyes to see your truth, and that your truth would set us free. Pray all this in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We're continuing our summer sermon series connected to the book uh, Gentle and Lowly, which we're going through in the coffee pot class. We've had some great discussions through that book. And today we're talking about the Holy Spirit. And there are a few better places to turn in all of Scripture to help us think about the Holy Spirit than John chapters 14 through 17. Because in these chapters, Jesus gives us some of his most extended reflections on the Spirit. But to sort of wrap our heads around a text like the one we just read, which I think we can all acknowledge is a little uh, confusing at times, a little wordy, it's hard to follow, we need a little bit of context for what's going on here. Because I think it's easy to read a passage like the one we just read, a passage that takes us straight into the heart of the deep mysteries of the triune God. And we read it as a theological abstraction, something that is not connected to our day-to-day -day lives. We often forget that we're actually just eavesdropping when we're reading this passage. We're eavesdropping on a real conversation that took place around a real table among real friends who were all dealing with a great deal of fear and anxiety. So here's the backstory for this passage. It is the night before Jesus's crucifixion. And he has gathered all of his closest friends together to share one last meal with them. And think about this from the disciples' perspective. Jesus has been with them for three years. They've done everything together. They've lived every, every part of life together over these three years. And they've accomplished quite a bit. And so the disciples are probably thinking, Excellent. We're just getting started. The best days with Jesus are yet to come. You know, we, we just fed 5,000 people. There's no end to what we can do next. Maybe we can even push out the Roman oppressors and reclaim this land for God. And then Jesus drops a bombshell on his disciples. He says, actually, I'm leaving. And the place where I'm going, you cannot follow. And then on top of that, he tells them that, that one of them in that very room was about to betray him. And he tells Peter 
who, who's sort of the, the, the head disciple in many ways, sort of one of the most fervent, faithful followers, he tells Peter that before the sun rises, within just a few hours, Peter will have had denied Jesus three times. You can picture it. This is not a room filled with a deep sense of peace that you'd probably associate with the presence of Jesus. This is a room filled with fear and anxiety and uncertainty. And so Jesus is not delivering a seminary lecture here. He is using his final minutes with his best friends, his most faithful followers, to bring them words of comfort. He's giving them words that will prepare them for the trials that they are about to face. Look at verse 27 with me. It's the final verse in our passage. In the midst of this uncertainty and fear, Jesus says, I'm leaving you, but I'm leaving you with peace. Therefore, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. That's the whole purpose of why he's telling them these things. He does not want them to be afraid. These are words and promises that I think we desperately need to hear today because just like the disciples in that room, we also face uncertain futures. We also face anxiety about the state of our world or fear about what's going to happen in our, our careers or our relationships or our families or with our kids. There is no end to the things that are giving us fear and anxiety and uncertainty. We need these words of peace. And when Jesus wants to comfort his disciples, he tells them about the person of the Holy Spirit. And so this morning, we're going to ask just, just two questions. Who is the Holy Spirit, and what does the Holy Spirit do? In other words, what is the Holy Spirit's role in the lives of followers of Jesus? Who is the Holy Spirit, and what does the Holy Spirit do? That's our roadmap for this morning. So who is the Holy Spirit? Who is the key word in that question? Who is the Holy Spirit. The reason the Spirit is such a profound source of hope and comfort for the disciples is because the Holy Spirit is a person. In verse 16, Jesus says, I'm leaving you another advocate. In other words, he's saying, I'm leaving you with a person who is just like me. The Holy Spirit is not a, a force or uh, this divine energy or, or a metaphor for the presence of God in our lives. The Holy Spirit is a person. Now, this brings us straight to the heart of the most beautiful and profound and yet just incredibly confusing truth at the heart of the Christian faith, which is, which is the Trinity, right? We profess that God exists in three co-eternal, equally divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this is, this is hard for us to conceptualize because there's nothing else like the Trinity in all of creation, right? All of our metaphors break down at one point or lead us to heresy more often than not, right? Because there's nothing quite like the Trinity. Now, I think it's fairly easy for us to grasp this concept that God the Father and God the Son exist as, as individual, distinct persons within the Godhead, especially for Jesus because Jesus uh, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, literally came down and, and walked in a body among us. But I think it gets tricky, especially with the Spirit, to think about what it means for the Spirit to be a person. And so what often happens is we end up treating the Spirit like the Force in Star Wars, right? Any Star Wars fans out there, the Force... Uh, we, we treat the spirit like this vague, mysterious energy that some people have, and it connects us all to the, the divine in the world, and it empowers us to do these supernatural things that we couldn't have always done. That's often how we think about and talk about the role of the spirit. Or, or sometimes we think about the Holy Spirit sort of as, as like fuel for our spiritual lives, like, like spiritual gasoline. One of my um, guilty pleasures is the Fast and the Furious franchise. Any fans out there? Y'all familiar? Yep. There you go. I, I love the Fast and the Furious movies. They're, they're totally ridiculous, but they're, they're lots of fun. And in, in the Fast and the Furious, some of the cars are equipped with something called nitrous oxide, right? And NOS is what they call it in the movie, NOS. And so if a driver is driving and he's like losing a race, he can press this button and it engages the nitrous oxide and this special fuel floods the engine and gives the car an extra boost to help it win 
the race, right? I think this is how we sort of treat the Holy Spirit, as, as there's a normal Christian life, and then every once in a while we get the Spirit, which gives us this extra boost to go the mile, to follow Jesus more fully. So we end up thinking about how can we sort of fill up our spiritual gas tank? But the witness of Scripture is clear. The Spirit is not a substance that we can get more of. The Spirit is a divine person who we can grow more intimate with. And so what would it mean to be filled with a person? What does it mean to be filled with a person? One commentator said that it's less like filling up a gas tank and more like being in love. And I love that imagery. Think about what happens when you fall in love, especially when you're young, maybe first love when you're a teenager or something like that. You're intoxicated by the object of your affection. You want to spend every waking moment with that person. You begin to see the world the way that they do. You adopt some of their habits and mannerisms. Before I was married to Abby, I hated the beach. I was a mountains guy. I wanted nothing to do with the beach. Abby loves the beach. Here we are seven years later, and I love the beach because through process of falling in love with her and being married to her and seeing her love the beach, it taught me how to love something new, right? This is what happens when we fall in love. We adopt their habits. Our ambitions change. The way we spend our time and money changes. Our priorities change. When you fall in love, your whole life is swept up into this person. And this is key. Everyone notices that something is different about you, right? Everyone can tell that something has happened to you. That's what it means to be filled with a person. It's this consuming, burning, deep desire for intimacy. And so Jesus is telling his disciples, I'm leaving, but don't be afraid because you are about to experience intimacy with me that is greater and deeper than you could ever have dreamed. Look at the text, verse 17. Jesus says, you will know the spirit because he abides with you That's great. Jesus was abiding with them at that point. Then he goes further, and he will be in you. The Spirit is with us and in us. And then in verse 23, we get what I think are some of the most astonishing words in the Bible. Jesus says, those who love me will keep my word, and we, the triune God, will come to them, and we will make our home with them. We will make our home with them. The story of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is the story of God's relentless commitment to being close to his people, even though we continue to reject him again and again. He is relentlessly committed to living among us, to dwelling in our midst, to giving us his peace. Could there be anything more worthy of our love and affection and worship than a God who makes a promise like that to his people. How could we be afraid? How could we despair? If you have said yes to Jesus, then you have a helper. You have a comforter. You have a friend. You have the divine person of the Holy Spirit who is always with you and within you. And and that's comforting. That's wonderful to know, but it helps us to kind of go a step further and say, okay, we have this this person, but what does the Holy Spirit actually do? What is the role of the Holy Spirit? Now, we sort of talked about this in the coffee pot class, but the role of the Holy Spirit is so multifaceted, right? Throughout Scripture, there are all these different roles that the Holy Holy Spirit accomplishes in our lives, and this passage doesn't even begin to scratch the surface of them, but I want to focus on just one aspect of the the Spirit's role in our lives. Look at verses 16 and 17. Jesus gives a particular name to the Holy Spirit that gives us a hint at what the Spirit does. He says, I will ask the Father, and you will receive another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth. The Spirit of truth. Now, this is an interesting cultural moment for the idea of truth, is it not? We've lost our shared understanding of of what the truth is. And even more terrifying, we've lost sort of a shared understanding of how we can even know that something is true. And and we see this in all 
our debates about politics and religion and morality and ethics, this is the cause of so many of our cultural divisions, our divisions within the church. And when Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of Truth, he's saying that there are some capital T truths that can only be revealed by the power of the Spirit. What is this truth? What is this truth that the Spirit reveals to us? Look at verse 26. Jesus gives us a summary of of the Spirit's job description here. He says, but the Holy Spirit will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. The Holy Spirit will teach you and remind you of all that I have said to you. We didn't read this particular section, but later in this same conversation, Jesus circles back to this idea and says, the spirit of truth will guide you in all truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and the spirit will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. One of the spirit's primary roles is to teach us and to remind us of Jesus' teaching so that Jesus might be glorified. The Spirit is the one who comes and makes Jesus real to us. Now, notice, and this is interesting, that the Spirit does not offer his own teachings. The Spirit does not bring us new revelations or commands. The Holy Spirit teaches and clarifies the Word of God that has already been revealed to us. Yes, God still speaks to us today. But he is proclaiming the same message over and over because every generation needs to hear it again and again. And the message is that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Repent and believe the gospel for the kingdom of heaven has drawn near. Some theologians have deemed the Holy Spirit the shy member of the Trinity. I love that, the shy member of the Trinity. Why do you think the Holy Spirit might be shy? It's not because he's timid or or insecure, right, which is often the reasons that we are shy. The Holy Spirit is shy because the Spirit is not interested in his own glory. The deepest desire of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Jesus. I think it's helpful to think of the Spirit kind of like a spotlight. Like imagine when you've been at a concert or at, at a theater. The spotlight exists to make sure that everyone's attention is on the star of the show, right? When a spotlight shines on one of the actors on stage, you don't turn around to look at the light. You look at whatever the spotlight is illuminating. The spotlight's job is to show us where we should look. And that's the role of the Spirit. The Spirit points us to Jesus and makes him real to us. It is through the Spirit in our lives that we have a real, genuine, life-transforming encounter encounter with the living God, with the person of Jesus Christ. So how does the Spirit do this? How does this work take place? I think the primary way that we see in Scripture that the Spirit points us to Jesus and teaches us his truth is through God's Word. It's through God's Word, through the Bible. Now, I might be uh, ruffling some feathers here. That's okay. Do you know where you are not going to find truth more often than not? Social media, cable news. Those are not sources where you will find adequate truth. Now, I'm being a little playful here, but I'm also being deadly serious, and I'm preaching to myself because when something significant happens in the world, my instinct, and often, I think, many of y'all's instincts as well, Um, When something happens, maybe, say, a bombshell Supreme Court hearing or the latest tragedy in the news, the the latest one of the week, our instinct is to flock to social media or to the news and to hear what other people are saying to help us make sense of the world. This is almost always the wrong instinct because the amount of truth you'll find there is extremely limited. And all those voices are just going to make us fearful angry, self-righteous, hateful, or anxious. It will not help you grow in the fruit of the Spirit. After something major happens, how many of you have gone on Facebook, seen everything going on there, and then walked away thinking, you know, I feel more equipped to love my neighbor? How many of you have turned off 
cable news and said, you know, I think I just grew in patience and discernment and love for others. I think I'm willing to give someone the benefit of the doubt now. No one ever says that because that is not what it is designed to do. So I'm not advocating for us sticking our head in the sand and just pretending like nothing is going on out there. But what I am advocating for is a wisdom that drives us first and foremost to God's word as our foundation for how we understand reality, for how we make sense of the world. Because it's through the word of God that the spirit of God equips us with the truth and wisdom and power of God. It is through the word of God that the spirit of God equips us with the truth and wisdom and power of God. Now, all that sounds great, but here's the part we don't like very much. We have to be very, very patient with the spirit more often than not. We are so often in a rush. We want the quick answer, and the world is more than happy to give us a quick answer. The Spirit does teach us, but it's rarely on our schedule. It can be a slow process. Some of you older disciples know that it can take a lifetime of slowly being taught by the Spirit who Jesus is and what he has done for us. I I was thinking about parents as I was studying this week. Whether whether your kids are 3 or 33, I think this is important for us to remember. Because if you've read the Bible to your kids, if you've prayed with them every night, if you've made sure they're in church each week, and yet they still have no interest in spiritual things, I think the word to you here is to be encouraged and to keep going, to never give up hope, to keep discipling, to keep praying. Because the spirit of truth is at work in invisible and slow ways. And we might never see that fruit for years to come. And that's true for all of us. I think that's a good reminder for all of us in our own walks with Jesus. So how do we know that the Spirit is at work within us? I think the mistake we make is that we tend to look primarily at the extraordinary signs, speaking in tongues, healing, uh, revivals, uh, or those real but rare moments where you seem to make massive leaps in spiritual maturity overnight. All those things are good. We should pray for them. I would love nothing more than to see more of that in our community. But I think the truest evidence that you have the spirit within you is usually far more ordinary and mundane. If the spirit of Christ is within you, then the spirit will lead you to confess that Jesus is Lord. And the spirit will lead you to live a life of obedience, a life that blesses others. Proclaiming that Jesus is Lord, obey his word and living to bless others. These are the surest signs that we have been filled with the person of the Spirit. And this is also the path to deeper intimacy with God. The kind of intimacy that the disciples had, the kind that sustained them as each and every one of them went from this room and over the years ended up dying for their faith. This is the invitation available to us this morning. This intimacy, this power, this peace, it is not for the elite Christians. It's not for the people up front in the robes. It is for all people who turn to Christ in trust and faith and humility. This is what we need as individuals in our marriages, in our relationships, in our homes, in our jobs. This is what we need more than anything as a church It's tempting to look at the worldly definitions of success and think we need more of that in our church. We need better facilities. We need a bigger budget, so on and so forth. Those things are great. But what we ultimately need more than anything in our church is Christians with a deep hunger to be filled with the Spirit. So as we close, let's turn to God now. Let's ask him for these things directly. Let's pray this for ourselves, for our lives, and for our church. I'm going to use the words of Psalm 25 as we ask him to give us this desire. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, make your ways known to us, O Lord. By your Spirit, guide us in your truth and teach us, for you are the God of our salvation. 
and we wait for you. Amen. As Court so rightly said, one of the things that the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Spirit, does is that he uh, affirms that Jesus is Lord in the hearts of, the, of his believers. So let us affirm the fact that Jesus is Lord by reciting the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Father in heaven, we lift up to you gratitude for sending us the Holy Spirit, your Spirit. Your Spirit leads us into all truth, and by him we are taught and assured of the gospel that your son has died for the forgiveness of our sins, and that we have been raised to new life. 
By the work of the advocate, your spirit, we are kept secure in your embrace, and all our prayers are brought before your throne of grace. We continue to lift up to you, Father, the people of Ukraine, this ongoing war displacing millions. We ask that you would protect these people. We ask that our brothers and sisters in Christ who are of and among these people would shine your light in this dark moment. Be a comfort to these new widows and widowers, to the, to the new orphans that are brought on by this war. Be a comfort to the parents who have had to bury their children because of this needless violence. Father, we mourn this morning with the people of Highland Park. A day of rest and enjoyment became a day of loss and grief for so many. We, we end up asking, Lord, when will this end? Like the prophet, we say, oh, Lord, how long shall I cry for help? We trust in your promise, Lord, though. We will watch and be amazed, for you will do things that we cannot comprehend. You will deliver us from evil. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Father, we pray for our city as we host the World Games. May we be good hosts and foster unity and friendship with so many from around the world. Keep us and our guests safe during this time. May we, your church, as ambassadors of your kingdom, give powerful witness during this unique time in Birmingham. As many who don't know your name gather in our community to watch and participate, may followers of your son be given opportunities to share the gospel. May the power of your spirit empower them to do so. May people learn that your son died for the forgiveness of their sins. May their hearts be softened to the new life they have by Jesus' resurrection. Lord, we know your spirit can do powerful things, and so may your spirit do a powerful work here. We also lift up to you all in our own church community who are in need, those named and unnamed. We lift up to you Dot, Tara, Jimmy, Geraldine, Nancy, Dean, Barbara, Jackie, Deborah, Mary Frances, Jean, Mel, Lynn, Joe, Donna, Malin, Carol, Jeannie and Helen. And finally, Father, we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Freely, we've been given every good and perfect gift from our Father in heaven. So let us now return our thanks by giving our gifts and ourselves back to the Lord. with 
Father, as a church family, we are grateful to you for sealing us with the promise of your Holy Spirit. We are thankful that the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is now working in us to do your good will and pleasure. Holy Spirit, we thank you for being our helper and living in us forever. We thank you for teaching us all things and bringing to our remembrance all things our Heavenly Father has said. Thank you for freeing us from the bondages of our fleshly desires, for leading us and guiding us to all truth enabling us to receive the truth of the word. Give us insight into the ways and purposes of the Father's will so that we may conduct our lives in a manner worthy of Christ. Amen.
Friends, as you go from this place, go in the peace and power and fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance on you and give you peace now and forevermore. And all God's people said, amen.